How come not many people need us? Uh, not sure. Yeah, I can start. Okay. So we are live now. Yeah. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is the first talk in a new series. Not many people need us. Sorry. Uh, not even. What's the problem, yeah, Ishwar? I don't have. Sorry. Okay. So we are live. Yeah. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is the first. First. Can we start? Yeah, but the echo is coming from you. I guess you can. No, 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 no not for me. I put it off now. Okay. Okay. Let's start then. So welcome everybody. This is the first talk in a new series called uh, IA Scope Seminar Series. Scope in turn stands for uh, Science Communication, Public Outreach, and Education section. Uh, so before I introduce the speaker and tell you why we are doing this, uh, the Dean of IA Ishwar would like to say something. So start, Ishwar. Oh no. I, okay. Welcome everyone. So uh, thank you, Yogendra. This first scope meeting, which is very important. So I think we have now uh, a very important uh, section within IAA having scope and then it is now uh, taken care of by leaders. Uh, I think uh, this will uh, uh, argue a good thing for uh, IAA in of Astrophysics and Disseminating Science, what we are doing at IAA as well, as getting information from other places also, like people like you are come, coming over here and giving talks related to general science aspects of it. So welcome, and then please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Ishan. So yeah, yeah, welcome everybody again. So the idea of this seminar series is to, is, uh, to uh, be as diverse as possible and include talks which don't come under the regular academic program, which also means that uh, the catchment for us is much, much more than the academic <laughs> seminar series. Which I'm very happy about. Uh, we plan to uh, we plan to cover a range of topics, uh, not just about uh, astronomy outreach and education, uh, but also science outreach in general, history of science. Very importantly, uh, you know, uh, big projects happening in outreach around the world, collaborations uh, which are happening within India and so on. So we plan, and, and as well as things which are kind of off interest to us, but doesn't fit into any of these. Like, for example, Chandar Mantra and so on. Right. So, so our, 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 the scope of this. So our series is quite fairly broad, and and we hope that we we'll bring in uh, interesting speakers to you uh, whenever we can, maybe twice a month or so on. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're very happy that the first talk is by uh, Professor Yogendran from ISR Mohali, though I think uh, who's visiting IA for a week, though I think a lot of us know him as Patta. Uh, I think he's been visiting quite a, uh, for quite a few times, so most of you know him. I of course know him for much longer because we did masters together, so I have a lot more stories about him than uh, most people here do. Uh, so I'm very happy that Pata is here to talk about Isaac Newton, the history of science. And I think really happy that the first talk is on history of science because uh, we don't really uh, know, learn much about it in, 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 uh, in our classrooms. When we do, we hear about it more in, uh, more in terms of a linear history of discovery where you know one person discovers a big thing and the next person discovers a big thing. But that's not true, yeah. as we all know, as researchers, that's not true. Uh, scientific progress is very non-linear. Uh, it has very, really, you know, a lot of blind ends and and backtracking and so on. And uh, Yogedan is here to talk about uh, one of the biggest figures in physics, Isaac Newton, and place him in the context of, of the history of science in a way which is probably uh, new uh, given what we learned in school. So, but uh, Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Neeraj, for, for the kind introduction. Thank you to yeah. IAA for hosting me and giving me this Fourth opportunity floor, to floor, present floor. some ideas that I put together over a uh, over a period yeah, of several yeah. years when I taught some a few courses in the history yeah, of science. I would also like to no, acknowledge and thank uh, Professor Chingangbam yeah, for inviting okay. me here and uh, collaborating with me over many years. So today's talk uh, will be about uh, trying to evaluate Isaac Newton's position in the history of science from a very somewhat narrow point of view that what does it teach us about what does it mean to be successful in, the hist in science. So uh, this is roughly the overview of my talk. Uh, so in order to 
the, the, the set of slides are divided into uh, three groups. Uh, science before Newton, and therefore uh, leading on to Newton's own achievements and an evaluation there. And perhaps um, the, the, we can talk a little bit about Newton as a human being and uh, the mythology that is built around him. Uh, but uh, this is probably not the right forum for such a talk, this particular aspect of uh, the talk. So uh, before we actually dive into the history, I would like to uh, point out that uh, in order to on Newton's contribution, we need to at least establish three different uh, positions. One, we should get a feeling for what was already known by the time Newton appeared on the scene. And what were people thinking around the time that Newton was around? And then when did the ideas of Newton finally come to be established as uh, the governing laws of motion and things like that? So in this talk, I'm going to focus on only Newton's laws of motion and gravitation. I'm not going to talk about his contributions to optics, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, or mathematics. I will briefly touch upon calculus, but uh, my focus is on the physics of uh, Newton's laws of motion. And I would like to add, if you have any comments or questions, please uh, do not, um, uh, you don't have to wait till the end of the talk, you can ask uh, in between as well. So when we study hist the history of science, um, there are various perspectives that we can adopt in order to study history. For example, one way to look at it is from the point of view of where we are now. And we can ask what are all the blind ends as Neeraj was pointing out, what are all the uh, you know, backtrackings and things come to be today. We can also try to look at it from the point of view of the past and in the context of the past, what people thought and what did they do and why they did it. And uh, in, in many of these cases, context is everything. So therefore, I will organize this presentation in a particular way. Please note that Newton himself has made such a comment that uh, uh, he, he says that he feels that much of his contribution was because he stood on the shoulders of, of giants. So uh, today's Newton's laws, we know that it depends on an understanding of space and time. We know that we talk about positions as being parameterized by time coordinate. And then we have a vectorial equation, F equal to MA kind of thing for the second law. And we have laws of conservation of momentum, which we now related to some symmetries. But uh, we are now, this, uh, this talk will try to uh, end with these, uh, these discoveries. So therefore, uh, we would like to start with, uh, uh, with, a, with a particular place and time. And uh, for most of uh, Western science, at least, uh, and what we call science, it, the, the logical starting point is that of Aristotle. Starting point, it may not be the starting point, but this is the best I can do, given that I am not a historian of science. So but the most interesting thing about Aristotle was that he denied the possibility of even having data. That is, he said that we can't have experiments giving us any true information. And that is because Aristotle pointed out that whenever we do experiments, we have an apparatus which is interacting with the system. And once you have an apparatus interacting with the system, you don't know that the quantity that you are measuring, whether that quantity is a property of the system or is it a property of the interaction between the system and the uh, measurement apparatus. Sometimes it could be entirely a problem of the apparatus, which is what we call systematic error. So these are things that Aristotle was already aware of. And I am, uh, of course, saying it in uh, modern terminology. But Aristotle pointed out that this immediately rules out any possible data. Because you can never be sure that the data is actually some kind of a property of the system. However, he said that this does not mean that we can't understand what is happening. So Aristotle pointed out that the, the key question is to understand what is the nature of change. And in order to understand change, we need to look for the way we need to look, we need to find explanations and be cast in the aspect in the uh, from the point of view of teleology. Teleology means we look at, uh, we, look, we try to ask why do things happen based on the ultimate purpose 
of that particular happening so in other words for example things move because they are not in their natural position and they would like to go back to their natural position and therefore it follows that every object in nature has a natural position and if on, and therefore changes happen only if objects are displaced from their natural position for example air which is a light object has a natural position of being up in the heavens and if it is not up in the heavens it would push its way up and that is what gives rise to pressure a heavy object which is displaced from the ground actually heavy objects their natural place is the center of the earth and they would like to go back to the center of the earth and if they are not in the center of the earth they will try to fall to the center of the earth so therefore any for any kind of motion it there is an agent that is required to displace the object from its natural position and in a way in, in modern parlance we can say that if f the applied force the agent is non existent then there is no change or there is no motion or velocity is zero particular aristotle pointed out or rather stated that heavier objects certainly fall faster that is the velocity is proportional to the mass so another important aspect of modern science is quantification so that is we express various experimental uh, quantities in the language of numbers so therefore we ascribe everything we would like to give uh, give a number to it and uh, the question is when do people when did people start assigning numbers to experimental observables and uh, perhaps we should we can say some with some degree of confidence that it starts with around archimedes or maybe a little bit before him and one of the great things about archimedes is that he was he uh, there's a very romantic story of how he became extremely enamored of his his power of counting archimedes almost invented a whole bunch of new words to show how you could count and he uh, constructed a kind of exponential number system using words and uh, he estimated using this particular power that he discovered Uh, that there are about 10 to the power 63 grains of sand to fill the entire universe this 10 to the 63 is modern notation uh, the, the particular number may be off by a few uh, orders of magnitude but it is certainly uh, clear from his own book which is the sands of Re the sand reckoner which is written on the right that um, uh, this particular uh, kind of an order of magnitude was his estimate so what is remarkable about archimedes in the story is that um the the application of a counting problem first of all how to count how to count very large numbers and then secondly using that number to to something very prosaic but uh, nevertheless an intriguing calculation that would give you the estimate of the number of grains of sand this would make a this is probably a very interesting phd level interview question for people Uh, for candidates and so on yeah and uh, famously of course archimedes invented uh, the lever and the, the the multiplicative power of the lever and also about hydrostatics and uh, the volume of displaced uh, water and things like that another interesting uh, and important contribution of archimedes is that he applied what is called the eudoxus method of exhaustion which is a way of calculating areas of circles parabolas and so on Uh, by using estimation using polygons okay so this is a uh, one of the first ideas of limits except that it was never um, given a formal structure even though euclid was already around and uh, euclidean geometry ideas were present nevertheless this remained as a as an approximation scheme with no idea that the limit existed Archimedes also proved that the volume of a sphere is two thirds the volume of the in the circumscribing cylinder. This is a rather remarkable achievement if you think about how to prove this without using calculus and uh, uh, but a, a rigorous the theoretical proof, none, nonetheless. Yeah, it is uh, said to be his epitaph. So in all this uh, talk, there are various. Uh, um, uh, phrases or uh, links highlighted in blue and these links will lead you on to further references and citations of the appropriate facts and uh, i have tried to be very careful to put together a, a precise citations 
uh, with uh, and references which are reliable. One of the problems in history of science is to find reliable references. So, uh, but around the same time, there were a whole bunch of scientists or natural philosophers. And these people included many names, some of which are probably more familiar to people in IIA than other places. But uh, for example, there was this very famous guy called Archytas, who apparently built a mechanical bird. And he also built a variety of, uh, a variety of devices which allowed him to prove geometrical theorems. Archytas was a very famous name, although the name, there are no writings of Archytas that are available, except as mentioned in other people's writings. Eudoxus was a student of Archytas, and it is Eudoxus' ideas which uh, Archimedes used in, and you can see it, even Newton used Eudoxus' ideas. So there were various models of the solar system by this time already. Okay, so among, this, among these models were both heliocentric models as well as geocentric models. And the uh, famous heliocentric models are those of Aristarchus of Samos. And uh, so others important um, astronomers of this time were also the names of Eratosthenes, which some of you might, might have heard as one of the first people to determine the radius of the Earth. And uh, uh, we will, of course, and Aristotle important, uh, uh, Aristotle himself contributed a very important model for the solar system, which held sway for a very long time. And let me remind you why people thought that the earth was at the center and why the sun, uh, the motion of the earth around the sun was, was very much resisted for a very long time. And the primary reason is that if the earth is going around the sun, then presumably it is a little bit like sitting in a car and going and traveling. Therefore, you should feel a lot of wind. And this wind, we don't feel. There are also all kinds of consequences of accelerated motion, which people did not know at that time that it was accelerated motion. But people had lots of commonsensical experience of moving in carts and so on. And they expected that those, those kinds of experiences would be natural if the earth was also moving. But such experience does not happen to you if you are sitting in your house. And therefore, it is natural that the earth is also stationary. Okay, And this, this idea of a moving earth without a moving, with, without extra wind and things like that, took a very long time to go. And uh, as we shall see, it took uh, nearly uh, Newton to, for it to disappear fully. So there were also, people were also considering motion, as I already mentioned, talked about Aristotle. But there are also people like uh, Euclid and Zeno, and in particular, Zeno is important for us. But we can't analyze motion in the usual sense because motion uh, cannot happen in time. You see, one of the one of the consequences of Zeno's paradoxes is that motion is not possible because if it has to happen, it has to have a start and a finish. But if you have to go from the start to finish, you have to go halfway. And then if you have to go halfway, then you have to go the quarter of the way and so on. And the limit is doesn't can never be attained. And this is one of the important ways in which we got around this particular problem was, of course, the invention of time as an axis. Okay, this, uh, the, this idea that time is a parameter for uh, quantifying motion, again, appears ve very, very long time later. And these Zeno's paradoxes took uh, a great deal of doing to get to remove. There were also many other names, as I have already written here. One of the important names for us is going to be Ptolemy and Hipparchus. Hipparchus uh, was one of the first uh, to have a to make a catalog of stars in the sky. I believe he had about 500 or so stars in his catalog. And uh, Ptolemy copied the catalog of Hipparchus and added several hundred more stars and created his uh, astronomical model. In the, in, the, in the upcoming decades. At the same time, you must remember that uh, taxonomy and uh, biology also took, took off around this time due to Aristotle. And uh, the guy who became the director of the Institute of Aristotle, uh, which is called the Academy, uh, Aristotle's Institute was called the Academy and uh, the sort of the boss of the Academy after Aristotle left was this guy called Theophrastus. Theophrastus uh, was a major uh, taxonomer in biology. So he had, he, he, 
he i think uh, classified a lot of species and tried to look for patterns in biological organized uh, animals and plants and so on so therefore uh, hunting for patterns is one of the themes that starts with uh, uh, starts a history of science and we can see various kinds of patterns being looked for in uh, in the greek writings of these uh, these greek people okay so uh, we, when it comes to proper investigation of motion and dynamics one of the first one of the most important uh, uh, stop points in this history is the ptolemaic model of the solar system ptolemy is uh, was a, certainly a, a person who lived around uh, 85 or around the, the first century ad uh, but uh, it is very likely that ptolemy uh, was more like a compiler of data rather than a scientist himself but nevertheless uh, ptolemy was very famously he put together a certain book which is called as the name of the book was megales in taxis which means the great synthesis so clearly he himself knew that he was putting together a lot of people's data and the book is now famous as almagest and almagest is a name that derives from the arabic for the greatest majest the word majest is also uh, has the same root as majestic and things like that almagest is a book that has tables tables of astronomical uh, positions and algorithms to work out what is the times of sunrise what is the times of sunset times of eclipses planetary positions equinoxes and the solstices equinoxes and solstices are important for uh, people who are doing uh, astrology as well as trying to predict uh, seasons and uh, harvesting times and so on the rise and fall of the nile and things like that therefore uh, this particular book allowed you to calculate in advance looking at the tables that was already there and applying the algorithm given in the book so in order to apply the algorithm properly you need to use you needed to use trigonometrical tables therefore tables of sines all needed in calculating the times of rise and fall later on uh, these trigonometrical tables were replaced by some kind of logarithmic tables but ptolemy's own uh, book already mentioned that if you were in different places then sunrise and sunset will occur at different times and therefore there was an algorithm given to correct for local variations from place to place ptolemy's model involved planets moving around in circles and these circles themselves were moving on other circles and finally all the circles were going around the earth and in some sense the earth itself was not at the center of this particular model it's important to mention that uh, contrary to popular imagination the, the earth itself there was this this concept called the deferent uh, which i forgotten what it actually does but um, the earth itself was not at the center of this entire model however um, as we will see over time people started moving various of these epicycles around that is the earth was sometimes at the center sometimes the earth was going around the sun sometimes the sun was going around the earth sometimes mars was going around the earth sometimes mars was going around the sun and so on however it was understood very clearly that the epicycles were a, just a representation it was just a model in order to make these predictions nobody ever thought to go out into space and looked for these uh, looked at the planets you will see that the planet they never thought that the planets were actually moving around in a circular track okay these epicycles were not observable experimental observables it was sort of visualized as a kind of a uh, kind of a model for us human beings to understand god's vision and god's arrangement of the planets around uh, as they move around so one of the interesting things that we can ask is ptolemy's model which was proposed let us say let us say this model was constructed around 100 ad and finally it it died or it it met its natural death at the end of let us say newton like roughly 1700 ad so that means that for 1600 years this model worked as an excellent model for cosmology it's a little bit like the you know lambda cdm model but lambda cdm model is only 30 years old Okay, so this was seventeen hundred years of survival for a model. Okay, so I would say that this is an excellent model. One of the ways in which we can ask how good this model is is by asking for its the errors 
or how accurate was the Ptolemaic model. And uh, by some estimates, Ptolemaic models are gives you three degrees of accuracy in latitudes and in uh, rise and rise times, set times, in planetary positions. Certainly, it was extremely accurate to within one degree. And um, with over last uh, name of Ulugbeg. Ulugbeg is an ast observatory that was uh, somewhere in the Middle East, and it gave you uh, planetary positions to 0.1 percent accuracy. Okay. However, um, there is an optimized Ptolemy model, which you would, is a, this is a paper on uh, in, on the archive, which suggests that you can even you can you could have improved Ptolemy model even more, and it would have been even better had Newton not come and wiped it out. We might maybe we may still be using Ptolemy's model. It was that good a model, so we should not laugh. I mean, the point about all this is that over a period of 1600 years, this model was not a static model. People kept improving it by fitting parameters and improving it. And over time it became, the errors went down and the model became less, uh, more and more simpler. Ptolemy's own model and Aristotle's model of the solar system had 50 epicycles. By the time we come to um, Ulugbeg, I think the number of epicycles had decreased to 10 and the parameters had been fitted to much better accuracy. Okay. However, even Copernicus's model, which, which came as one of the uh, points where uh, Ptolemy's model was being overthrown, Copernicus's model itself had about 30 epicycles, as we will see later. Okay, so from Ptolemy, this, uh, the, the way astronomy itself evolved was through the Middle Eastern astronomers, the Arab astronomers. And the Arab astronomers were mostly you could say they spent time trying to improve Ptolemy's models. So especially here, I'm only listing a certain kind of uh, chronology. This chronology consists of a bunch of names and all these people I'm just suggesting where we can view it from the modern point of view as a gradual improvement in fitting coefficients, much like the way we do science today. Like slowly things get uh, keep getting better. You get uh, better and better materials. You in, in, in engineer band gaps with more and more efficiency. And finally, you get blue color LED at the end of 25 years. So in the same way, we can say that over a period of 1,000 years, these models became much simpler and produced a very effective model for the prediction of uh, astronomical data. And it is a true prediction, mind you. Because the number of epicycles was only 10, but you, you could predict uh, data like sunrise, sunset, and things like that for, with arbitrary, uh, for arbitrary dates. So this is how the science was progressing. And it is, it is uh, important to note that all these people, they built a variety of astronomical observatories. For example, at Toledo, in this Marage in Iran, the Ulugbeg in Samarkand, and so on. And of course, uh, Tycho Brahe as well, and uh, Kepler in the year 1600s. Everybody was involved with experimental astronomy, including uh, building a variety of telescopes and, uh, and measuring latitudes and longitudes using a variety of instruments whose accuracy was, was improved over time. And um, new and more elegant methods of uh, measurements were also being invented all the time. Okay, so one of the important things that also took place around the same time involving many of these sa the same names like Al-Khwarizmi and Al-Biruni and Al-Tusi and so on was the study of motion. Yeah, so many of these names that we are, I have mentioned here, they were also engaged in questions about how do we quantify motion? That is, what is the meaning of change? Where do we observe change? How do we quantify this change? Is there, is there a distinguished object called force? What, how can we distinguish force and mass and things like these? They were objects of, these were all questions of intense debate over this period as well. One of the important names that comes in this particular history is this of, of uh, this person called Ibn al-Hayatam. Al-Hayatam is in the West was called Al-Hazan. And Al-Hazan is a scientist who worked in Cairo, who for, ex for our purpose, one of the most important contributions he made was this particular figure, which is the visions of binomial theorem, as I would call it. As you can see in this figure, you, th this figure tells you how to compute the sum of n, uh, the sum of the squares of integers. Okay, and the way this figure works, I will not explain it here. I will leave it in the slide. Those of you who are interested, please follow it up. 
but this was not the only thing he did this based on this figure he, he built a whole recursion family on how to compute things like the sum of squares sum of cubes and so on and based on this this particular figure and its this way of calculating we will see passed on all the way to newton via oxford university and things like that and um, so this is the beginning of if you like binomial theorem and calculus one way of talking about it of course i don't want to oversell anything and say that uh, al hayatam was responsible for calculus but what is certainly clear is that if you look at a certain way of uh, uh, certain way of looking at this graph you can see that the sum of the calculating the areas is somehow equivalent to integration and calculating the areas gives you the formula for the summation of squares as well okay and one of the other important thing that this al hayatam wrote a book called doubts concerning ptolemy in other words the aristotelian vision of uh, the solar system was was being taken apart people were examining the various assumptions and questioning whether these assumptions made sense okay so and now let us come let's step back for a minute in order to build up newton's laws we need to understand the difference between kinematics and dynamics and in order to set up kinematics we need to we need to understand we need to track the evolution of the concept called velocity and acceleration dynamics appears when kinematics gets related to force and the, the proportionality object turning out to be inertia okay so to see the evolution of these concepts we should perhaps start with this person called john philoponus philoponus was a, a scientist again let us say who lived around 490 ad and it is another important name this is a rather remarkable person who actually suggested a theory of impetus the the, the concept of impetus was was a certain kind of a um, a force if you like or a certain kind of a power that was transferred from the agent which set things into motion into the object that was in motion this is what if you like we would call momentum okay and philoponus proposed that there is such an such a concept and this as long as there is momentum or impetus in the object that is moving it will continue to move okay now you might want to say that this is the first law of newton or if you like second law with a with a certain squint but this is not any of those things because even even though philoponus had this idea of impetus there were different kinds of impetus that were being proposed for example circular motion had its own impetus there was a circular impetus if you like there was a linear impetus there was a parabolic impetus and so on so there were different kinds of motion had different kinds of impetus so it's not exactly the same as what we would like to call inertia although this is the beginning of the idea for sure subsequently another important figure is somebody called avicenna or ibn sina ibn sina was pointed out that in order to talk about speed and distance you really need to have a concept called time and distance and speed are related by this concept called time so in some sense he was unpacking the idea of distance Uh, as speed as velocity you see velocity means we have to first talk about parameterization of the distance uh, with as a function of time and then th it's only then we can have a concept called velocity uh, two other famous guys this ibn rashid and uh, ibn bajja these two fellows were uh, if you like students or um, directly influenced by avicenna and these two, these people were they opened up the idea of motion as being made up of three pieces one there was that there was an agent which was a force there was a medium which resists the motion and then there was the quantity of the object that is undergoing motion and i put question marks here because i am not 100% sure that we can attribute these ideas to these people but nevertheless somewhere around this period there is a whole bunch of names i only picked out a few uh, for a lack of space on this slide and these people were the ones who were proposing that medium and force and mass are implicated in motion there are a couple of other names which are important and the these last three names we will take up uh, in the next few slides so now uh, so 
so up till here we are talking about 1100 or 1200 ad and around this time europe began to come back into prominence and losing its uh, uh, status as the center of science and uh, medieval europe has um, consisted of a very large number of small kingdoms city states and principalities and everybody was Uh, building various kinds of business enterprises and trading with each other and there were all kinds of small kings and larger kings and uh, very large kingdoms as well and there was a question of pr pride and patriotism which led to incredible amounts of uh, development among the the various aspects of this development engineering and measurement are important to us because for example the first clocks came to be came to appear because we we are we need to talk about time and measurement of time requires clocks and the first really some kind of good quality clocks appeared in around 1300 AD maps for trading and navigation started appearing and in order to, in order to make maps you need to find good ways of uh, drawing uh, representing distances accurately and especially if you accept the idea of a spherical earth then you need a notion of a projection map and these projection maps were already being created at around the, around this 1200 ad or so uh, to accurately represent distances between places trade effectively uh, similarly printing appeared around 1450 and printing is of course extremely important in uh, dissemination of knowledge information and horoscopes and uh, this this printing revolutionized the subject of science uh, in particular because some of the more popular ways of vernacular writings of galileo stephen and people like that could spread widely and far including uh, uh, racy books on uh, let us say making money from horse racing and things like that another important aspect of this middle east medieval europe is the invention of Uh, or rather incorporation of the decimal system the hindu decimal system which via the arabs became very popular in europe around this time around 1500 or so due to the work of stevin in uh, in uh, in the netherlands and uh, the decimal system made it easy to write down large numbers and it became important in uh, subsequent quantification of data the discovery of americas made something happen and one of the important things that it did was that from the americas people brought back to the Euro back to europe a variety of animals and and these animals mentioned in the bible and so now it became a little bit of a surprise how come the uh, the bible which is god's word uh, where was missing a whole bunch of animals and so the power of the bible as a keeper of knowledge started waning around this time once you have free access to information people are free to think about it as they like and therefore both printing and this discovery of america sort of shook the power of the church as the keeper of knowledge it is around this time that the arabic the the science of the of that was being developed by the arabs made its way back to europe and to um to the to the uk and also the continental europe so that happened via spain and italy portugal and so on and there was this movement called the translation movement which translated the arab uh, books back into uh, greek and uh, latin in particular and one of the important things that happened was al haytham's books and writings made its way to oxford where it fell into the hands of these people called the oxford calculators and these oxford calculators namely the some of the major names are thomas bradwarden hatesbury swineshead and dumbleton and so these people what they did was they were actually so they were giving up aristotle's ideas and you can see how bits and pieces of the ideas start going away and bits and pieces of the modern idea of calculus and measurement of velocity start appearing around here one of the first ideas that went away was aristotle's idea that the the velocity or the the rate of motion is proportional to the applied force and inversely proportional to the resistance now the problem with this was that of course if this was you it, it doesn't does not predict that if the resistance is more than the force there won't be any motion you 
you see this predicts that if the resistance is even more than the force there is nevertheless some ratio the ratio is not zero and uh, whereas thomas bradwarden and uh, people they propose that we should replace it by an exponential function so v is like some kind of logarithm or exponential of f by r so that when f by r is less than 1 um, the power will make it go to zero go towards zero whereas f by r is more than 1 uh, there is a distinguishing uh, there is a difference between f by r being less than 1 and more than 1 okay so these guys they also pointed out that there is a difference between mean velocity or mean speed or mean rate and instantaneous velocity and therefore words for example uniform motion was that where the velocity was a constant and i am talking loosely about velocity and speed they are all the same here right now so there, there was no concept of a vector as such so uniform meant that it was uh, independent of time diffeiform meant that the first derivative was non zero okay and diffeiformly diffeiform means that probably second and third derivatives were also non zero okay so they had such terms like uniform diffeiform motion uniformly diffeiform diffeiformly uniform and things like that and various constructions and using these concepts they were able to show that if you had uniform acceleration the distance traveled was proportional to the average velocity which is the mean value theorem of calculus what we call rolls theorem or something like that maybe this is the second rolls theorem or first rolls theorem or something and this they also prove that the average velocity this is equivalent to the previous one of course that the average velocity is half of the initial and the final for uniform acceleration which is certainly the mean value theorem of calculus as you can see the first idea of calculus is appearing here and we can it is i think fairly clear or one can make a very sh a sure statement that this idea has continuously evolves it into newton's calculus so this is the evolution of calculus now let me go back to dynamics and we appear and as i pointed out earlier this name of buridan is an important name in the in the history of science buridan built took off where avicenna stopped and he proposed that in the ideas of philoponos he that motion was uniformly it kept continuing because there is a property of the body which it acquired when it was set in motion and this property buridan called it impetus that was not the only thing so this impetus is very much the same as the philoponos impetus but buridan also said that impetus is proportional to the motion and to the amount of matter so in some sense it is proportional to the velocity and to the mass and he therefore pointed out that we can say that motion stops because impetus is lost due to resistance okay even though this idea looks almost exactly the same as newton's first law still we cannot say that this is the discovery of of the first law of uh, newton because even for buridan the natural state of motion the natural motion is that of circular motion and uh, circular motion is was was an is an important ingredient of in all these uh, models because the circle is the most perfect shape in some sense it's an ideal so the most symmetrical thing is somehow the let's say the natural thing okay so it's not very unnatural to imagine that circular motion is the is the the perfect kind of motion yeah so then we come to the uh, the next big name who is orem so nicolas orem was buridan's student and in per in orem we see the first idea of time space and motion as appearing explicitly orem introduced the idea of graphs where he he plotted on the y axis the sort of intensity of the quantity on the x axis was the duration of the quantity and the kind of quantities that he plotted were temperature pain grace grace of god and so on and he, and the area under the graph the area of the graph so formed was supposed to be the a measure of the total quantity of that uh, that intensity that is being plotted using these ideas of graphs he was already able to show that the distance traveled is average velocity into time and for uni this is for uniform motion of course it is written by uh, there is a the, in the writings of orem we will find uh, these sort of gedanken experiments that if the earth is if you make 
the center of the earth and you drop a stone that it will oscillate about the center of the earth this was already written by uh, uh, rem and i don't know exactly what made him invent or even conceive of such a such an idea on the other hand he also point, he was he, he definitely invented the idea of galilean relativity that is if an air was enclosed in a moving ship then it is as if the whole ship was not in motion as long as so it's not clear to me whether he actually pointed out that it needs to be uniformly moved or not but certainly it is certainly the idea of inertial frame was was opening up out here okay so after orem we come to steven which is the next important name whose name i already mentioned in the context of uh, double entry bookkeeping and the decimal system simon steven is a, again a forgotten name in the history of science the important thing about steven was that he was a sort of an engineer and uh, he in the year 1586 he dropped different sized balls from the church tower in delft unlike galileo galileo definitely do uh, looks like it, he did not do this experiment but uh, simon steven did it and he did observe that the rate of fall was independent of the weight simon steven also demonstrated the hydrostatic is that uh, you know liquids occupy the same height under conditions of identical uh, pressure and uh, he reanalyzed the lever because he in, he understood that there is a concept called force by itself and he invented this idea and he applied it to show how force balance kind of experiments can be uh, force balance can be understood by drawing various vector diagrams of the of forces and in particular this particular figure here which is called the epitaph of stephanus is is meant to show that he he analyzed the balance of forces on the two sides of the parallelogram by actually drawing the parallelogram law of forces by adding forces as vectors so it is here we first see the idea of a force by itself and the idea of a force as a vector and also the idea of those so called force diagrams or the free body diagrams that we start teaching in our schools colleges stevens ideas passed on to beekman who was uh, not exactly his student but uh, definitely he was strongly influenced beekman and beekman certainly influenced descart descart because descart was directly a kind of a student of beekman you will see was a very strong influence on newton it's at this stage we come to kepler because please note that uh, this is the year 1600s and 1600s is when kepler appears on the scene and as probably many of you know, know kepler uh, analyzed uh, the motion of planets uh, using the data of tycho tycho brahe and he spent 17 years at the data analysis and at the end of that 17 years which he called uh, his war with mars he was able to show that you get excellent model for the solar system if you assume that all planets move on ellipses and that the ellipses are all centered around the sun the sun is at the focus of the ellipse and uh, he in other words completely establishing a heliocentric model a fully heliocentric model and one of the reasons why he established a fully heliocentric model although tycho brahe himself had a very complicated model of the solar system which involved Uh, the sun and the moon going around the earth earth being stationary and non rotating while all the other planets went around the sun this was the model of tycho tycho brahe and it was the most popular model at that time however kepler overthrew it fully and the reason he overthrew it fully was because at that time there were six planets that were known and there are these five platonic solids and what kepler wanted to see was that in the orbits of the planets are organized according to the volumes of the solids and so he had a certain idea called the harmony of the spheres and based on these models because there were five solids and there are six planets he could arrange the five five solids and the orbits of the planets going on circumscribing spheres and that was a perfect model of planetary motion in particular he discuss he discovered the second law which is the equal area business and it was very it made him extremely happy because it showed a certain kind of a symmetry of this uh, arrangement and this uh, second law 
was, however, as we know, it is just a consequence of the law of angular momentum conservation and doesn't really tell you about the inverse square law. However, for Kepler, the third law, which is the ratio t square, the time period square by radius cube being constant, this was not as important as the second law. All right. It is a little bit surprising that he didn't uh, take, uh, he missed the importance of this, uh, this particular law. One of the other consequences, one of the other important things that Kepler discovered was the inverse square law, of, which is the one by R square uh, beer Lambert law. Now, uh, Kepler hypothesized that planets are being kept move, uh, in their motion around the sun. The sun exerts uh, some kind of a force on the planets through the light that it uh, that it's through some kind of rays that it emanates and but from here he did not make the jump to 1 by r square force law even though he had an 1 by r square inverse law of light propagation it's a little bit surprising okay um all right, but nevertheless, Kepler did not investigate dynamics. Okay, this was only kinematics of planetary motion. Note that there are two different kinds of motion we are discussing. One is the idea of motions of planets and things like that. On the other hand, there are motions of bodies and things like that, which are being governed by this impetus theory. And these have no contact with each other until now. It is here that Galileo appears on the scene. And Galileo was the guy who made the contact between the two. So it is widely believed that Galileo did all these things, that uh, Galileo dropped balls from the Tower of Pisa. He did not do that. He said that he was the first to see the moons of Jupiter. He did not do that. He was not the first. Harriet was the first. Uh, he was not responsible for the mathematization of motion. This must be clear to all of us now because I have presented a gradual evolution over a period of a thousand years where gradually mathematical concepts started appearing one by one into quantification of motion. Okay, But it is certainly true that he was persecuted a little bit by the church. So what exactly is Galileo's contribution to the history of science? Okay. I mean, uh, Niranj, how much time is left? Uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Or one yeah. hour. Yeah, yeah, 10 minutes, right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right, so I, that's good. Yeah. So what Galileo did was that he in interpreted astronomical phenomena in a way that, uh, that demonstrated that astronomical phenomena are exactly the same as terrestrial phenomena. Okay. That, that is terrestrial physics is the same as celestial physics. In particular, he pointed out that the mountains on the moon cast shadows in the same way as Earth's mountains cast shadows. He could even estimate, some people say, the, the, the height of the mountains by looking at the length of the shadows. Uh, he discovered sunspots and therefore sun became something that was not exactly a clean uh, heavenly object because it had spots and stains and that these spots were rotating with the rotation of the sun and therefore the sun became a rotating object. This is a def definitely a discovery of Galileo. Galileo also observed and systematized the study of free fall kinematics. That is the displacement is half, KT, half GT square. The displacement is proportional to the square of the time. This is something that Galileo dis uh, discovered. And what he did was he certainly pointed out that it is the same free fall kinematics that we should apply to the motion of the planets as well. In order to build the free fall kinematics, Galileo constructed thought experiments by first observing that we should study free fall kinematics uh, and investigate whether S is proportional to T square. And he showed that S is proportional to T square by applying it to uh, balls sliding down in inclined planes and gradually in increasing the angle of the inclined planes till the angle became 90 degrees. And when it became 90 degrees, then that's like free fall kinematics. Okay. So these are the contributions of Galileo. And as a result of this, it became clear that we should apply the same kind of ideas to celestial motion as to terrestrial motion. And that whatever is the laws of motion that governs uh, objects on the earth, the same thing should go govern, same idea should govern the motion of celestial bodies as well. It is here that now we will see that the ideas of uh, Newton's laws are almost already in place. For example, if you look at Descartes, Descartes already had three laws of motion. Descartes' laws are like this. 
For example, the first law of Descartes says that each thing always remains in the same state of motion unless something else presumably happens. That all motion is along the straight lines and upon contact, that is when two things are colliding, there is as much that is, uh, this is some kind of momentum transfer that is being discussed. So you see, this is, this is very much looking like Newton's laws. Okay. But as we have seen, already bits and pieces have been put together by similar statements have appeared in all the places all over time. And therefore we need to be a little skeptical about exactly what was being achieved here. In particular, Huygens who appeared later pointed out that Descartes ideas of collisions were completely wrong. And he worked out the correct ideas of elastic collisions in particular leading rise to the idea of kinetic energy conservation. Huygens certainly was the first to develop a formula for centripetal force and centripetal force is an important uh, um, step, stepping stone in the history of mechanics because in this case, the direction of particular to the direction of velocity. Therefore, the vectorial nature of force is extremely important here. But okay. So, therefore, now we can see that the appearance of the idea of force and its direction has become important other than its magnitude. But Huygens is already Newton's contemporary, and they definitely exchanged uh, lots of uh, emails. Now we come to the, <laughs> at this stage, we can talk about Newton's own teachers. Newton's teachers were these two um, major scientists. In particular, the idea, this man called John Wallace uh, developed the first ideas of integration to find areas under curves. And the way he did it was by improving on the binomial theorems of uh, al Hayatam which came via the Oxford calculators. And this binomial theorem was improved because he was trying to develop fractional powers and therefore trying to find the area under various kinds of curves, including cubics and quartics and things like that. And uh, John Wallace and uh, Isaac Barrow, who were, uh, Barrow was at Cambridge and Wallace was at Oxford, I think. And uh, Wallace built on Huygens ideas and analyzed inelastic collisions of bodies. Please note that these are all people who are totally contemporaries of Newton. Okay? Here that we see that uh, Isaac Barrow invented the concept called the first order infinitesimal. A first order inf infinitesimal is like what we call dx in calculus. dx is such an object that dx itself is not zero, but dx square is zero. That's called the first order infinitesimal. And uh, it is used in calculus in order to build the ideas of limits and so on. So it is here that Newton steps on the scene. And now we can take stock of our situation. What did Newton have to do? So, so far as we see, so lots of kinematics of free fall has been put together by various people. The same ideas of kinematics of free fall should also be probably applied to planets. And collisions point out the importance of momentum as did the ideas of impetus of various people. However, for circular motion, force is necessary and that it is not, not a natural state. Contradicting Aristotle, this had to be clearly understood. And it is not very clear to me whether Huygens himself understood that uh, this is not a natural state of affairs. Therefore, And furthermore, a new idea had to appear that uniform motion is a state. It does not require uh, any forces to act on it. In particular, it's not a process. It's not dynamics. It's kinematics. It's totally, yeah, nothing is happening when there is, things are in uniform motion. And all these ideas you had to apply to uh, motion of planets, and this is the great synthesis that Newton had to perform. Okay? So this is the, the context of Newton in this entire story of the history of science. In particular, let me point out that this one by R square idea of force law already appeared many times before. In particular, it was certainly Kepler already had vaguely one by R kind of ideas, but after Kepler and up to Newton, lots of people were playing around with lots of powers of uh, forces, power law kind of forces in particular. Yeah. So one of the most famous names in the story is this person called Ismail Bullilov, whom we don't even talk about. Yeah. Right. So this is the history of for Newton himself, but uh, I'll ignore this slide here. So this is now we we'll, we'll try to evaluate Newton in this context. Okay. So this is the this is a list of uh, some kind of a list of what Newton did in the in science. What is the kind of scientific achievements of Newton? 
in the scientific achievements you can see calculus laws of motion or optics colors the theory of colors telescope uh, the motion of the moon tides calculation apples comets 1 by r square fourth law precession of the equinoxes which can uh, law of cooling age of the earth etc etc lots of achievements right so this is what a really great man because it's not one or two things he did some 20 odd things and all of them are like some kind of seminal ideas so let us take stock one by one and i'll close with these last few slides on uh, the three points that i brought up newton's discovery of calculus if you like was a way of calculating the tangent so this is what he did he if you like came up with an idea of the uh, the derivative and this derivative was expressed using some language called ultimate ratios okay however this is far from the idea of limits as we understand it today in particular 100 years or let's say 50 years or 60 years after newton bishop barkley after whom university of california barkley is named bishop barkley pointed out that the subject of calculus of newton it is haunted by all these departed quantities these second ultimate ratios and things like that therefore it one couldn't clearly conclude that there is any kind of a limit that actually exists okay so the notion of the, the a rigorous idea of uh, a logically precise and a rigorous idea of limits had to come much much later another 100 years later when finally weierstrass appeared on the scene and they have instruction uh, finally made its place so therefore one can't say that things ended with newton and newton was the discoverer of calculus their important ideas still had to come, had to be worked out although the germs were there the laws of motion well as we saw if you like by a generous um, estimate philoponus was the guy who started it off and it went all the way through descartes before newton before uh, becoming its shining version in newton's hands second law had all these other names implicated in them and the third law which is the uh, action reaction law these are the other names that are uh, that are implicated however what newton certainly did was he removed the idea of force from um, as an independent uh, independent from the source of the force and therefore made it possible to apply it universally okay and this is how he he was able to apply it to gravity he applied it to fluid mechanics and so on and thus he built a system for the entire universe to apply mechanics to the uh, to the this, to the laws of motion of the entire universe okay so i would like to stop here this is a good place to stop two slides which are talking about other things in particular they also talk about the person of uh, of newton the, the human being called newton and uh, for example this case of the missing calculus is about that about how newton actually never used calculus in his uh, laws of motion he even though he discovered calculus well before um, very early on in the game his uh, newton's first law second law and third law were all worked out by using pure geometrical methods as discussed by his teachers okay i'll stop here and i'll take questions if you have any thank you thank thanks for that that was, that was an amazing talk uh, it and, and i think everybody can relate that to how we do science uh, at this time as well so uh, what, so yeah let me just uh, push, show the last slide here which i have uh, which i think is important so this is the summary of newton and uh, we have to remember that uh, the story still continues that uh, special relativity quantum mechanics quantum field theory and quantum gravity they all have um, they say that the question is not over yet and we are still continuing in that topic it's not yet done and in particular this is what i think we can learn from our uh, uh, thing i i thank you sorry sorry no no, no that's fine that's fine but uh, yeah so so i, I think that was a lovely talk and and uh, you know as patta kind of indicated uh, in his abstract as well uh, these are these are not just matter of history but uh, these concepts also useful to evaluate the way we do science uh, in current times as well the concept of a lone genius or, or versus the concept of incremental evolution of ideas and so on uh, so at this point uh, thanks again patta let's open it up to questions uh, you can just 
do use the raise hand feature in Zoom or or on, or just type it in chat or or however you prefer. Yeah, how do I see this uh, raised hand feature? Okay, I need to show. Well, I, I can see it, and I can then ask them to unmute. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So questions, comments, especially. Yeah. Yeah, Wagesh Mishra, you can unmute and go. Yeah, so I am very curious to just uh, know about one fact that uh, when this Newton was like uh, coming into this modern science, then already the Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler had uh, like uh, told about the heliocentric model of the universe. But still at that time in the Europe, the geocentric view of the universe was very popular. That's so, right. and, yes. Just after the Newton came as a Royal Society, like Royal Society of London, as a member or the president, the view of Newton got very popularized. So do you see any role of the society in... Oh, excellent question, actually. Yes, yes, yes. So I think um, I would, there's a small... Uh, so the, after Kepler, I think after Kepler, um, especially, so one of the things that happened after Kepler's, uh, Kepler worked out the uh, motion of the planets was that uh, Kepler's predictions of, let us say, things like uh, you know eclipses and equinoxes and uh, solstice and things like that was vastly better than any other astrological astronomical tables. Okay, so I think about hundred years after Kepler, like sixteen hundred and twenty nine or so, was the uh, tables that Kepler released. By seventeen hundred and thirty or so, uh, this. Uh, 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 completely had taken over uh, the Kepler's model was totally the dominant model of a solar system. But it is it is important that the inst the institutions like um, there were three or four institutions that became very important in this. One was the Royal Society, and the other was this uh, the French Academy. The French Academy was also founded around the same time, and the societies were really important in spreading this knowledge around. So, for example, with the aid of the printing press and with the aid of funds that they could collect from members and various, um, uh, so they were releasing things like uh, navigation tables, measurements about um, uh, tide tables and things like that. And this data became very important and it cemented this particular model. Definitely. So, therefore, I think without a doubt, uh, both Royal Society as well as Académie Française as, and a few other such societies were very important in this history. I didn't talk about it because I, I don't uh, have a good perspective on them. I'm not a historian of science. So I have written here that vibrant institutions were very important and are very important. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Uh, other questions, comments, please? You can just type it in chat or, or raise your hand. Or, uh, yeah, uh, Rajguru? Uh, hi. Hi, hi. Very nice talk. Thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, the calculus is, uh, uh, was it independently uh, developed by Leibniz or? Uh, yes, or yes. Mostly so, attributed so, to Newton. Uh, no, 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 no. Certainly, I think the some of the important ideas of calculus were independently de uh, developed by Leibniz. There's no doubt about that. But Newton definitely was uh, understood it better and applied it Although there are important, uh, so th there are some people believe that Leibniz was the better philosopher because he understood the the logical subtleties of his. Uh, of, see the, the problem of limits and uh, whether the limit exists and the series converges. These are ideas which took a very long time to um, come into place, and Leibniz mm -hmm. understood the difficulty better than Newton. But Newton applied it better. Newton was definitely by far much stronger as a scientist in the sense that he applied calculus ideas remarkably powerfully. Okay, okay. Did they communicate with each other? Or oh, there was massive fights, man. There was massive fight. In fact, I have a slide about that. I never talked about it here. But um, there was this huge fight about him and uh, Leibniz about calculus. Hmm. Yeah. So there oh. is this, yeah, I, yeah it's a, that's a story by itself. So there are references to those, those um, discussions, arguments, fights, and all kinds of things in my slide, okay? So you will enjoy all those questions are discussed there. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. All right, okay. 
Thanks, Rajiv. So we will. I'll get all the links from Patta and put it up on the YouTube uh, uh, show more section. And I will also get his PDF with me. If you want the PDF, uh, just just email me as well. Uh, Vagesh, did you put up your hand again? Yeah. So just one again curious question. So before that, I would make a disclaimer that I am not a person taking pride uh, like fake pride, empty pride in Indian discovery. But still, I would like to get his comments on like some people have uh, written books saying that uh, calculus was also done in 14th century in Kerala. Some like uh, many schools and there is a so my question is like do you think that non european contribution to mathematics should also be something talked about in modern no, science no, there's no doubt no no you are right so so what is certainly clear is that um, it, it is not correct to say that calculus happened in uh, in the kerala school of mathematics but what is certain is that they did develop the idea of infinite series and um, things like uh, taylor expansion and things like that without using calculus okay yeah okay yeah, so, so so it is it is true there, so there are very important uh, mathematical ideas um, especially about number theory and about um, such kinds of uh, geomet some kinds of geometry as well as these kinds of things which were developed in india but i don't think this ever uh, this was indicated meaning the continental uh, mathematicians had no interaction with kerala school uh, i think this is my knowledge as of now uh, there is a very nice book which i would like to very uh, somewhat uh, majorly scholarly book written on this topic by uh, professor divakaran uh, pp divakaran i would like you to look at, take a look at it where a very um, balanced appraisal of uh, this subject is presented it's somewhat uh, difficult reading my mind you Okay, yeah, it's a very interesting book. Yeah, yeah, because in fourteenth, fifteenth century, if you see, lot of European people used to come in India, right? So there may be transmission of knowledge through Arab traders. Just so, my guess. <laughs> that is partly true. So even before that, uh, yeah, no, no, certainly there was a lot of trade and so on, and lots of ideas were passed around. Only thing is. this particular uh, kerala school of mathematics somehow i don't think uh, there was any communication okay okay yeah thank you yeah in particular this particular blue link here about descartes uh, tries to establish a connection between descartes and uh, uh, indian schools of philosophy like especially buddhist philosophy okay yeah so, you. of kerala school uh, which which year was it uh, which one which period of uh, uh i mean the kerala school of mathematics uh, yeah so period. something like it's around 1100 up to 1400 let's say so there okay. are several names but uh, there is no you know one of the interesting difference between uh, this western thing that i i sketched out is the fact that there were lots of people there are lots of names one after the other and there is in fact evidence like uh, for example you can if you go to cambridge you will see a library card of cambridge university library showing newton issuing descartes book you understand so there's a library card which tells you that newton referred to the works of descartes so, so there's a sort of a tradition of this kind that you can work out and you can piece together such a tradition is not available in india we don't have that kind of written evidence uh, or uh, and so this kerala school of mathematics has only three or four names that i know of and they're far apart and so it's not exactly clear wh why they did what they did how did they use what it, whatever they thought of and whether they uh, to whom they taught these things and who were the students and so on yeah so therefore we don't know much uh, information at least i don't know much information can i add to that pata yes please yeah, so kerala school i think start, is is roughly it lasted till the 1700 to and started around 1300s and in fact it kind of died by the time it died down it, it was basically 1800s uh, and there was a stand, there was a lineage of teachers and students there which is which is well known but only few fact, names uh, are sort of i thought uh, known so there's this narayan mishra or something like that so uh -huh. i forgot him right so somebody from so, uh, num and so on so but, but then for example nilakanta somaya ji who right. came up with trico brahe's model a few decades before he did so we know his students and we know his teachers and all of that so even even the taylor series thing you talked about uh those are those are well documented i think but it's not but like you say there's no evidence 
for any contact with with europe that i think uh, is very speculative <laughs> like wagish said okay okay rajkumar do you have a new hand up no 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 not a new hand i still didn't put it down but i wanted to uh, okay. but uh, yeah. can i ask one more yes yes just yes. a comment i mean uh, you had put in your last slide uh, the set of points uh, which you want to learn take away points right so funding is necessary but i'm just wondering <laughs> can you say a little more about what he yes. tells yes. us about funding <laughs> oh yes yes no 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 so 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 for example like uh, is arab astronomers right uh-huh. so for uh, for many of the astronomers um, you so if we start from uh, ptolemy or even aristotle aristotle and ptolemy were in the uh, uh, were working in the area of egypt and uh, greece uh, in that uh, golden crescent area okay when the political situation in that area became unstable and the centers of industry and the political capital shifted to the arab world the mm. center of science also shifted okay, okay. Uh-huh. and uh, in particular um, the major scientists they just simply carried all the books that the greeks had for example ptolemy's uh, book almagest just simply was copied over and simply people uh, just carried the library into uh, things like baghdad baghdad became a very major center of science okay so in this period of from let's say 1100 until let's say the mongols appeared on the scene baghdad was a very important center basra was an important center and then it moved on further in fact even uh, uh, as i said samarkand it became an important center of astronomy it was funded by mongols okay okay so that is that, that is important and subsequently when we come to things like uh, newton descartes and uh, people like that uh, the funding agencies changed in particular in the medieval times when we talked about uh, stevin before galileo the funding agencies became all these small kingdoms these um, um, so every what used to happen was every group of let's say every 100 square kilometers there was a sort of a princely state which had a prince and that guy in order to show that he was a supporter of science and he encouraged trade and so on he would employ scientists engineers map makers instrument makers professional astrologers okay hmm. kepler for example his working job was uh, that he had to do uh, he had to keep a track of taxation information in particular taxation of uh, uh, liquor production beer barrels and uh, in one place at least he had to find ways of uh, determining how much beer was being produced so that appropriate tax had to be uh, calculated in another place his professional job was to make horoscopes for the king and his court okay. but that was where the money was coming from the money for printing the astronomical tables came from the prince of that uh, that uh, that uh, state which was this prince rudolf and then of course after kepler it shifted to royal society and uh, wealthy people funding it all right thanks <laughs> so it is so in the story funding plays a very crucial role and there is an important story of uh, economical uh, aspect of this history of as well yeah uh yeah other questions comments please if not i have a question in the meantime so yes. you were kind of very provocatively said in the abstract that uh, you no know, this whole incremental science rather than lone genius is should also affect the way we evaluate great science and scientists in the current times so do you want to say something on that yes yes thank you so uh, uh, yes so you see one of the things that i tried to convey in this uh, talk was the by mentioning a whole bunch of names which you have ne- most likely never heard of right so but these are important names they are people who made very important contributions except that we have completely forgotten about them the the major steps in the history of science for us uh, in when we learn it at school are maybe aristotle but after aristotle we come to newton after newton we come to einstein and that's how it goes right there are no other people in between and when you see this way that the science is portrayed whereas on a day to day basis what we are doing is we are just instrumental accuracy by a few percent and we are making uh, 
uh, small uh, improvements in some parameters and slightly tweaking some model and writing our papers, um, we, we are going to be most likely forgotten, right? Just like, but these names that I am mentioning are not forgotten. In particular, I am talking about them 500 years, 1000 years after them, right? And, but in the big scheme of uh, public view, they are all non-existent people. And so you see, what is now? What does it mean to be successful in science? Is are you going to be successful if you are an Einstein or a Newton, or uh, will you be happy at being, let's say, Ismail Boulau, or uh, maybe you know one of the other names whom I never mentioned here, right? So who are you going to be? You need to reevaluate, right? And uh, it is important, I think, to keep in uh, mind this comment of Weinberg that I mean, yeah. So there is a there is a take home message of a somewhat subtle kind that uh, who are we going to be? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really like the story of Ismail Boilau, for example. Boilau was a person who himself was never a scientist. He was, lots of science communication passed through him. Okay, he was in communication with a very large number of people, and he had genuine insights, but nobody ever talks about it. Yeah, even even Einstein, for the matter, Hilbert was only apparently a few months away from writing down the field equation before. For GR, you no, know? no, no, yeah, GR, that's yeah. a little unlikely. Yeah, meaning that's because I've tried to, to, I've tried to work <laughs> that out actually. I it's, it, that looks so Hilbert was so you see what happened was even after Riemann, right? So even Riemann and uh, so after Maxwell, everybody started playing with the idea of uh, fields, the concept of fields, and in particular Riemann played with the idea of fields. In, uh, uh, so, there were lots of people who were trying to construct an elastic model for space-time. Okay? Some kind of a, uh, that the space-time is like an ether, you know, the fluid uh, hydrodynamical model. And so, uh, but the, the equivalence principle, however, it was uniquely Einstein. So, Hilbert never in any way came close to the equivalence principle. Okay? So, Thanks. there's an important uh, difference. Yeah. Other questions, comments before we close? Well, thanks again uh, for, for coming to Thank join you very us. much. Thank you. Thanks, Patta, for an amazing talk, as usual, uh, with some provocative stuff for everybody uh, here and there. So, uh, I, I'll, I'll, uh, Patta's PDF will be with me, including all the links he's mentioned. And if you want the copy, just, just uh, message me and I'll send it to you later. And we'll also upload all the links on, on the YouTube. Uh, 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 YouTube show more section as well. So thanks, thanks again, Patta, and everybody who joined us. And the next next talk in the series will be on twelfth by Dr. Shairaja uh, about this recent her translation of this sixteen hundred and four book called Ganita Kannadi, which is a book uh, written which is a book written in old Kannada on maths and astronomy. And so she and as she and and that person's great 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 grandson have jointly translated this book into English and she'll be oh, telling us all about that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would thanks like everybody. to close by wishing everybody a happy new year. Yeah, hopefully you have a good year. Bye. Bye.